Welcome to Oncology Today, the management of HER2 altered non small cell lung cancer. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. For this program, I met with Dr. Bob Lee from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. To begin our conversation, I asked Dr. Lee to review the evolution of targeted treatment for patients with non small cell lung cancer. It really started, at least in lung cancer, from the EGFR story back in, that was almost two decades ago. And the Tom Lynch paper was really a major landmark publication at Sea Change. It took another five years or so before it got uh, translated into saving lives, right? Because back then the EGFR inhibitors were developed for all commas. You know, there was a saying, I think it was picked it up from your podcast, everybody get a dose of Tarsiva before they go to hospice. Uh, and, and I think Corey Langer, uh, you did an interview with him and, and he had quotes. So I was driving to my, to, to work and I heard <laughs> So, so, uh, That's that was funny. how it was discovered, you know, discovered that it, the drugs were discovered before the targets were, were really found. And, uh, and that general, uh, inhibition just doesn't work because it's not a, it's not the right, uh, binding, uh, into the, uh, to the molecule. So, the EGFR mutation discovery, uh, and at the time, Tom Lynch, along with uh, uh, a group in uh, Dana-Farber. Uh, so Tom Lynch was at Mass General. Dana-Farber, there was sort of a close second. They had a publication in Science about two weeks later. And then MSK was also working on the same thing back then with Harold Varmus and William Powell and Vince Miller and others. And it was really three groups simultaneously showing the same thing. And that was around 2004, but it didn't it took until 2009 when the IPASS trial was published in the New England by Tony Mock, Elong Wu, and others. And that was a Pan-Asian study. And EGFR mutant lung cancers was seen more common in Asian women who never smoked. And that They had an advantage in terms of enrolling these patients. And that led to a, a complete change of mindset in thoracic oncology. So the clinical trials were the ones that translated that discovery into uh, clinical practice and saving lives. And of course, that then led to subsequent generations of EGFR inhibitors, as well as our multiple generations of ALK inhibitors and ROS inhibitors. They all share the same mechanism of action. It's about this lock and key approach. If you find a, a mutation in the oncogene and that drives the oncoprotein into uncontrolled cell proliferation and metastasis, and you see that there is a, a cleft or a pocket in the oncoprotein and that you can fit a, uh, a drug into it and so to lock it up, so to speak, and it then this just suddenly stops that signal and, and then the cell just stops dividing and, and it dies. So that's the, the sort of concept behind uh, original thought process in, in the uh, targeted therapy world in lung cancer. However, things are now moving beyond that. So when we get to HER2, People have tried that lock and key approach, but it just hasn't worked out. It's actually been studied for about 20 years, ever since the trastuzumab revolution in breast cancer in the year 2000 or so. And, and for 20 years, we've not been able to, to develop a HER2 targeted therapy in lung cancer because the, uh, firstly, the, the just replicating the trastuzumab trial from breast to lung didn't work out because they were different. And secondly, the, uh, the incidence of HER2 expression and amplification, for example, is vastly different. The mechanisms are different. And the other uh, aspect is the lock and key approach just doesn't work too well for HER2 uh, mutations. At least the early generations of drugs didn't do a perfect bind. These were insertions in Exxon 20, and the, there's no pocket. It's a different shape, and it's, you don't have a nice key that can just lock it up. So that's why the tyrosine kinase inhibitor trials have largely failed, whether it was neratinib or afatinib or dacomitinib, and we published those trials, and they were sort of showing some modest responses in the 10 to 20% range, but nothing, nothing outstanding, nothing that could beat chemotherapy, and therefore uh, it's been disappointing. But to go beyond that, Science of HER2 activation in lung cancers is seen as different. A lot of them were driven by mutations that are hyperactivated that leads to internalization of the tyrosine kinase and the receptor, uh, the HER2 receptor. And 
in a way, without having too much HER2 protein on the cell surface, they kind of just go into the, uh, they hyperactivate, they internalize into the cell, and then it gets recycled. So that, if you attach a uh, antibody drug conjugate onto it, it literally just sucks the, the drug into the cell. You can see that ADCs can get into the cell through a variety of mechanisms. The, the traditional understanding is the one on the left-hand panel. You had lots of HER2 protein on the cell surface. You just need a lot more to, for the drug to bind and therefore get in. That's the traditional dogma. And that's why a lot of the uh, very prominent scientists and physicians in this field have warned me, you're not going to you're going to get a negative trial with the HER2 mutant story because there are not that many receptors on the cell surface. Um, but my curiosity sort of prevailed and, and we still did the trial anyway, and it was positive. So that then led to the second mechanism of action where there's not, there are not that many receptors. There are always going to be some, but not uh, amplified or overexpressed. And what they do is merely just sucking the drug actively into the cell much more at a much more internalized rate than than the wild type uh, receptors so we call that internalization through ubiquitination but it's really literally just sucking the drug into the cell and these mutants are very good at just internalizing the uh, the drug and if you have a precision guided missile with a warhead with a powerful chemotherapy that is un incompatible with life if you just give it naked but if you pack it into the antibody and the and the cancer cells suck that drug into the cell and then you release the bomb from within and kills the cancer cell that kind of precision missile attack uh, had actually worked and we we initially found that in case reports. Uh, there were case series from Europe, uh, Julian Maziers and others uh, from France had published, uh, and those were anecdotal. Uh, the lab evidence was lagging, so we decided there were some preclinical hypothesis that we, we came up with about this internalization theory, but it wasn't proven at the time. So we did concurrent lab and clinical research experiments. We then uh, took the clinical practice back to the lab. So it's research to practice and back to the lab uh, to research. And we can then label these antibody drug conjugates with those rhodamine dye, and we call it Frodo because it's pH driven. And then they sort of glow in the dark. And then you can see the rate of internalization of these, um, of these ADCs into the tumors. Here we were able to show the one that I were labeled, uh, the ADC is going into the cell in real time. So if you go to the next slide, we can then see the rate of internalization of these ADCs into the cell uh, at different rates. So we call it sort of the trafficking index. That's how fast these drugs can get into the cell. So some of the cells that literally pull the drug into the cell and they traffic very quickly and others are very slow at doing that. So that was sort of the the mechanism of, of response that, that we looked at. And then we then took this to the clinic again, and that led to the Destiny Lung 01 and the registrational uh, trial uh, approval just a few months ago. And there was a lot of skepticism at the time, this was 2014, that uh, many HER2 experts uh, who really spent their lifetime doing tyrosine kinase inhibitor cell signaling and lock and key approach all people in breast cancer were really looking at the quantity of HER2 and it's driven by HER2 amplification and overexpression rather than mutation. Uh, the concepts are very different and they just thought that the ADC approach is never going to work in HER2 mutants in lung cancer. So it came as a surprise when the TDM1 trial was positive and, and then that led to a lot of interest from biopharma industry to invest in this uh, rather obscure field when it first started. And we saw, I mean, these are real, there's, these are still 2% of lung cancer. You look at ROS1 and ALK, it's not that many more in terms of uh, percentage incidence. We're talking thousands and thousands of patients every single year, just in the United States alone. So, uh, and worldwide, it's a lot of, a lot more patients. So then it led to some interest in this field and then the strengthening from the TDM1 pilot study, which was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology back in 2018. Uh, we did a series of uh, translational experiments that showed that this was not a fluke. This was a real effect that, um, uh, that was replicated in, in cell lines, in mouse models, uh, and some of the slides I 
put some pretty pictures there just for reference. And we then were able to uh, guide the registrational trial of trastuzumab deruxtecan, which was first uh, developed for, for her to amplify and then her to low breast cancer. But it's all largely due to protein expression, not mutations. But because of this internalization concept that, that we had uh, published and shown subsequently, we doubled down on that in lung cancer. And that led to the, um, uh, the registrational approval, the first targeted therapy for HER2. But it's a different mechanism. It's a smart bomb uh, and precision missile compared to a lock and key approach. So, uh, and you know, it was interesting, uh, last, uh, the last ASCO meeting when we had the HER2 low data presented and Dr. LaRusso did the discussion and she brought up the issue of HER2 mutant disease. And when I would bring that up to the breast cancer docs, they would, they were like, well, we hardly ever see it. And it was just kind of a, not a major issue for them. Even in, in GI cancer, where again, TDXD and HER2 positivity is a big issue, colon, upper GI. I think it's mainly overexpression there also. So as you say, it's a really different concept. Um, first of all, can you just kind of maybe outline a little bit about, I guess, the epidemiology? Like what fraction of patients with, you know, non-small cell lung cancer have HER2 mutations as opposed to HER2 overexpression? For every patient with HER2 overexpression, how many are there with HER2 mutation? Is there like 10 times as many? It's a lot more, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. The epidemiology is different uh, by disease. So compared to uh, breast cancer, where 20% are HER2 amplified, which then produces the expression, the genetic t uh, aberration is, is amplification. And that's just increased gene copy number in, in breast and, and gastric. And I tell my patients or my fellows that this is like going to the old fashioned uh, photocopy. If they're a bit older, I can explain the photocopy machine and you press on the uh, button and you forget to let go. And then you really, you, you, you're chatting away and you realize you copied 50 pages uh, and it was a total waste of money and paper and, and, and the environment. That is amplification. It's, it's, there's no difference in the genetic coding of the, um, of the sequence. And, and basically, it's the same thing, but copied again and again and again. We call a copy number gain, and when it gets to a certain threshold, we call it amplification. Mutation is, uh, is different. It's not just the quantity of the, uh, uh, the protein that's been expressed or copied. It's the sequence is different. They've, they've done an error. It's like they wrote the wrong thing. And the DNA sequence is wrong. And that could be wrong because you've switched uh, a letter for another. So that's single nu nucleotide variation. Or you can write it wrong in the sense that you've put in, you've inserted a list like 12 extra letters in between the sentence. So that's called an insertion. Or you can just delete some stuff which you forgot you, you deleted it. And that's a deletion. So these are uh, so-called mutations. And that is different because the, the wording is different. The content has changed. But that change in content has led inadvertently uh, to uh, activation of the gene in uncontrolled fashion. So, uh, so that's a, a slightly different concept. So you're not going to get too many copies. You're not going to get too much protein on the cell surface. You're just going to get a different HER2 that functions crazy. It just grows and divides and uncontrolled. It just functions wrong. But the, the number of copies of HER2 uh, is still the same. So in that sense, in lung cancer, it's only about 2%. 2% are uh, mutant uh, in terms of all total non-small cell lung cancer. In lung adenocarcinoma, probably 3%. And you do have a 1% to 2% uh, also uh, uh, incidence of HER2 amplification in lung cancer. So that does exist, but not as nowhere near as frequent as the 20% in breast and gastric cancers. So you have amplification in lung cancer and you have mutation in lung cancer. And according to our translational studies at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and elsewhere, those two are largely separate targets. They represent different patient populations. There may be a small overlap in the order of 5 to 10%. Uh, but they're largely separate. The mutation cohort of patients tend to be younger people, often women, and often never smokers. And those are, it's a pretty uh, 
it, there's some analogy to EGFR mutation uh, in, in terms of epidemiology, uh, but it's not, ex it's not predominant Asian. There is no racial ethnic uh, predominance for her to me. I've seen her to mutations across patients of all racial ethnic backgrounds uh, and and it's not related to smoking. It's something in the environment that may have uh, triggered it or, or just a combination of multiple factors uh, with a lot of bad luck. I've seen patients, uh, there's no sort of single uh, exposure that I can pinpoint. I've seen patients uh, who have, you know, my one of my earliest Australian patients came from a farm, was very clean air, was no industrial pollution, but he had HER2 mutant lung cancer and was pretty young as well. So that's... Uh, it's a different category of lung cancer. Uh, and that's about 2%. But when you talk about uh, amplification, it's a really a miscellaneous group of diseases in lung cancers. You do have uh, the heavy smokers, uh, and some of them have HER2 amplification. Some of them are squamous. Uh, but also up to a half of them actually have EGFR co-mutation. So you then have a HER2 driver and an EGFR driver, and often the HER2 initially thought to be a resistance mechanism to EGFR inhibitors, but subsequent research has shown that it's not always at resistance. Some of them had, had HER2 amplification at the outset. So you, you really have this molecular heterogeneity uh, in HER2 in terms of its oncogenesis in lung cancer. So I, I categorize them as mutation as one group, amplification as another. Uh, and it's really the amplification that drives the high level of, of protein expression. Uh, and that's how I see them in terms of uh, therapeutics, but also in terms of drug development and clinical trials. Well, also there's the issue of the phenotype of the patient and some sort of corollary issues. So, you know, just to pick out one is, you know, sensitivity to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Actually, I think I saw a paper that you did looking at, I think it was HER2 mutant showing no responses. And that's kind of what we hear with ALK and EGFR. Is that the viewpoint or is that the way you see HER2 mutant, you know, not necessarily very responsive to IOs? And then what about the HER2 amplified? Do they, are they sensitive to IOs? Yeah. Uh, our early uh, analysis uh, of this group showed that the IO responses tend to be low compared to uh, the general non-small cell lung cancer population. And it corroborated with the European experience uh, with Julian Mazier's Annals of Oncology in that series had shown a 7% response rate. So it's not zero. They, some of them do respond, but it's, ex it's actually lower than what you expect with the general population. So single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors tend to reserve later line rather than upfront for HER2 mutants. There's a German series in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology that showed that if you do combination chemoimmunotherapy, um, they may do do okay, but it's hard to tease out whether it's the chemo that did it or is it the immuno that did it. So we're, we're in the process of running a randomized phase three trial of comparing first-line chemoimmunotherapy versus trastuzumab, deruxtecan, TDXD in the first-line setting. And that, because it's such a rare uh, mutation, we really had to get the, the world together to do this and to get meaningful time frame in terms of reading out results. So hopefully through international collaboration, we can, we can get the results in the next couple of years uh, to give us the answer for optimal first-line therapy. It'll be interesting to see what happens there in terms of PD-1 levels. Maybe you can take a shot. I've asked a, a lot of people to explain to me, and I'm going to let you take your, your shot at it, sort of the biology of not just HER2, but also EGFR. Like recently yeah. I became aware that, am I right in saying that HER1 is actually EGFR? Yeah. That's right. So I, I didn't know that, but anyhow, it just reflects my lack of knowledge about that whole axis and HER3 and the fact that there's not a TKI. But anyhow, can you just sort of maybe explain it, you know, the way you explain it to fellows, your vision of that whole axis? Yes, yes. Thank you. It's a good point uh, you, you just made. Uh, academics work in too many silos and they don't necessarily talk to one another. And, and then you have different lingo coming out of their publications. So EGFR is HER1 and that's the neighbor of HER2. 
Uh, and HER2 is also called many things, HER2 new, uh, ERB2, uh, and these are just because of different academic groups doing their own thing and calling, calling their own things. And then in the scientific literature, it gets very confusing. Um, and that's, that's just uh, an effect of different uh, academic silos not collaborating well enough. But hopefully, uh, research to practice will inform and uh, help break those silos so that we are talking about the same thing. And that way, that way we can advance this field of science in much expeditious uh, fashion rather than keeping it you know, to your chest and in your own little world. That's what academics have an inclination towards. And um, in the big picture, these are all uh, so-called uh, human epidermal growth factor family of receptors. So those are HER1, HER2, there's HER3, HER4, and they all uh, act, they are all proteins on the cell surface. They serve as signaling fac um, growth factors so that the cells have to talk to each other with, with signals. And once you get a signal, her, the HER family of receptors are responsible for sending those signals into the nucleus of the cell for DNA replication. So they sort of control and then they have to do their job in terms of growing when you need to grow and stopping the growth when you don't need to grow so we don't grow forever so they're, they're, that's the normal part of human biology all our cells in our body uh, have her receptors on the cell surface uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to survive but when the genetic codes of her her2 or her1 or egfr get get um, uh, make a mistake uh, such as a mutation, an error in the coding, then those HER receptors, whether it's HER1 or HER2, can misbehave or just grow uncontrolled. And that's when it starts to uh, send those signals down to the nucleus and telling that specific cancer cell to grow and, and divide. And, and meanwhile, the rest of the normal cells are still having normal HER, HER2 or HER1, but the, the mutant cells in the cancer uh, they they want to take control, so they they grow and divide. So her family is really integral, and it's been a um, very important target uh, for for cancer therapeutics. EGFR is certainly the poster child for lung cancer uh, precision medicine. Her one and her two is the poster child for breast cancer uh, precision medicine. With with all the revolution since the uh, days of trastuzumab, but certainly many iterations of trastuzumab related therapy. And these have transformed uh, lung cancer and breast cancer survival uh, in, in really amazing uh, ways. So that's the paradigm, and, and it's going back you know, 20, 20 years or so uh, since, since the original discovery in the last century. And this is a continued area of investigation in so many other tumor types because the, all the cells have her receptors on the, on the cell surface. And to the extent that we can give the right drug to the right patient, uh, then we're going to make a difference. And that's why we're now seeing approvals in gastric cancer, uh, now in, even in colon cancer with, with uh, the trastuzumab to catnip story in her to amplified colon cancer. And, and we hope to see many more other types of tumors uh, that can be targeted with her to targeted therapy. So we're going to be talking a lot about uh, TDXD, of course, but I also, as long as we're talking about the sort of the HER and EGFR axis, wanted to ask you about HER3. I, we did a program with Dr. Passiani recently where I think I picked up a little more about this, but still trying to figure out. So you have an antibody drug conjugate, betridumab, that targets HER3. Like, in your mind, how does that work? Yeah. So HER3 is, is another neighbor in, in the family. So you've got EGFR HER1 and then you've got HER2. And HER3 and HER4 are next door neighbors who actually cross talk with um, HER1 and HER2. So we call that process dimerization when the two receptors bind together and they send signals to one another, reinforce the signaling down to the, um, uh, to the nucleus. Often to send that signal, the way it's worked out is that the HER receptors need to talk to each other to send that signal. You can't send that signal alone. So it's either HER2 will talk to HER2, uh, multiple HER2 receptors get together and send a joint signal to the nucleus to, send, to tell them to grow, and that's called homodimerization. And then if you have EGFR or HER1 
it's the same thing. And then her one will, will get together with her two or her three. Uh, and then they decide, the two receptors decide to send a joint signal to the nucleus to grow. That's called heterodimerization. And it is really the HER1 and HER3 heterodimerization uh, that is actually required for EGFR mutation signaling that lends itself a target for HER3 antibody drug conjugate. And remember, I, I said that when you activate through dimerization, that is, you actually ubiquitinate and internalize. So those receptors get sucked into the cell uh, as you do so. So when you bind the uh, cancer cell with a HER3 antibody drug conjugate like patrutumab, deroxidecan, or HER3DXD as they call it, then it binds to the HER1 and HER3 dimer. And that dimer will suck the drug into the cell. And that dimer is going to be more active if you're EGFR mutated uh, to begin with, so that the HER3 will latch onto the HER3 and EGFR dimer, and then it gets sucked into the cell and releases the smart bomb and kills the cell uh, in a totally different mechanism to EGFR inhibitors, which is the lock and key approach. And so you, you rather than switching it off with the lock and key, you're really just throwing a bomb into the cell and then blow, blows it up with chemotherapy. Very different mechanism of, of uh, action, and therefore it has the potential to overcome all types of resistance mechanisms to TKIs. So within that model, what's your vision about how pertuzumab works in breast cancer, for that matter, how trastuzumab works? Yeah, so trastuzumab is um, naked antibody without the, the warhead. So it doesn't have the smart bomb. So it's a, it's a missile, but it doesn't have the bomb. So it's, it's a very different molecule. What it does is it's got multiple mechanisms of action. And to this day, I don't think anyone's really crystal clear in terms of how trastuzumab has produced its wonders in so many patients. It, it certainly has a signal inhibition capability. So it, it, it basically binds to the HER2 protein and tries to tell it to stop. So it's, it's antibody inhibition. So it sends a, a rather weak signal on its own to reduce the, the signal for growth. But more importantly, it actually elicits an immune response, uh, ADCC. Uh, and that's, that's certainly part of the innate immune system, but it's antibody dependent, you know, cell mediated uh, uh, cellular cytotoxicity. And that, that will localize the enemy with HER2 and then elicit these um, antibody responses that are uh, cell mediated. And then we can, we can really um, uh, elicit a long-term response through that ADCC mechanism in the long term. And that's thought to be the main mechanism of action for these 10-year survivors of you know, metastatic breast cancer on trastuzumab in you know, 10, 15 years. And then you get into the Neil Love question of when do you stop, when do you continue? And, but you're really, you're really relying on an immune response in, in that sense. It's not so much the chemo that's doing the work. And certainly there's synergy with chemo as well, which may actually elicit that immune response. And that's why in breast cancer, you have to give it with chemotherapy. Uh, naked antibody alone just it doesn't cut it in terms of response rate and, and, and survival. So in lung cancer, the early days of uh, trastuzumab-based clinical trials have been done since the trastuzumab revolution, but all six trials were negative, including a randomized phase through, uh, two trial that was published by Dr. Gates Meyer in Annals of Oncology. This was you know, early days in the beginning of this century. And and it was all negative, but the patient selection was very different. It was, it was really looking at HER2 expression, but we know that expression tends to be low in lung cancer, not as high in breast. It's not as frequent to get amplification. And in the subgroup analysis, they saw a signal in HER2 amplified cancer, but there were only like six patients, so it's hard to draw any conclusions. So therefore, it's the difference in molecular epidemiology that actually pretty much guarantee the failure of these trials, even though they were done in good faith, replicating the breast story into lung. But the, uh, the epidemiology was different, and therefore the trial design was flawed, and, and they failed. But I do see a role in trastuzumab and pertuzumab in the longer-term future, 
when it's done in combination with other other medicines. So the trastuzumab pertuzumab story uh, is certainly uh, the Cleopatra trial a decade ago, and then ma many other uh, improvements uh, since uh, have been the mainstay of therapy, even this day in first line uh, metastatic breast cancer, you know, HER2 target therapy. But in lung cancer, uh, we've done, we've seen the My Pathway study uh, showing some response in the 10 to 20 percent range with trastuzumab, pertuzumab, not enough to to do the uh, serious damage on HER2 mutants. But we are seeing some signal of activity. So I believe it's the weak effect of the um, uh, of those antibodies on inhibition and then eliciting an immune response that may still be targeting. And I think in the long term, you really have to learn from the breast cancer docs. You give it with chemo to elicit the immune response, and that may actually uh, give, uh, give more better long-term outcomes. And there are trials ongoing. Certainly one was already published last year with Dr. Julian Mazias in the uh, JCO. Uh, on giving trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and uh, and a taxane chemotherapy, and it showed uh, just under thirty percent response rate, which is better. It's an improvement compared to naked antibody uh, approaches. And in the future, I believe there may be more uh, combinations uh, that could be uh, exploited uh, to to render a, a more durable response. I'm not sure about the tucatinib combination in lung cancer. We've certainly tried that with um, afatinib and lapatinib, and it hasn't really panned out very well. Uh, but the jury is still out. And certainly you can leverage that the same uh, rationale about the immune response in antibody drug conjugates, which all contain trastuzumab. So there's a certainly an area of investigation combining them with immune checkpoint uh, perhaps the innate immune system can have an interplay with the adaptive immunity of T cells with the uh, IO uh, checkpoint inhibitors uh, combined. And there's a b body of preclinical work saying, showing that ADCs can actually prime the uh, adaptive immunity and render itself to better response. This is an area of my investigation as well, uh, especially after giving ADCs. Can you mount an immune response, turning a cold tumor to hot, so to speak, and then render them respond, knowing that these tumors don't classically respond, but maybe you can turn that into a hot tumor and then respond. I've actually shown that in, done that in, in some of my patients, and I'm very pleased that uh, some of my patients are having long-term response to immune checkpoints with HER2 mutation, but done in, in this sequence of doing a bit of ADC priming and then, and then giving immune checkpoints later on. Uh, and, and, you know, some of them are just responding for five plus years and, and disease free. They were on the verge of death initially. So, uh, but I, I'm not replicating it in every patient. So certainly more, um, translational research needs to be done and a lot of thought process needs to be put in in terms of clinical trial design to maximize these immune effects of trastuzumab related targeted therapy. Yeah, you hear about uh, ADCs and uh, IOs in different situations like in uh, bladder cancer, they're uh, all excited about and ADC and fortimabidotin plus IO, they think that's going to be, and it kind of makes sense because it's really, in yeah. a way, chemo plus IO, which, yeah. you know, lung cancer really define that. Let's talk a little bit about what we know about uh, ADCs in lung cancer. You mentioned TDM1, and I, I remember there was a paper, but I think Greg Raleigh was involved with it, and I didn't think it was all that impressive, but did they see objective responses with TDM1? Yeah, so there were actually quite a few papers uh, on on this. Firstly, the international trial of TDM1 wasn't that impressive. It was published in Clinical Cancer Research with Solange Peters and Tom Stinchcomb uh, and many others, and it showed a uh, 0% response in HER2 2+, and a very low response rate in HER2 3+, but maybe a signal in these amplified cases TDM1. So that was the paper. It was a negative study, but maybe some signal finding uh, that warrant further investigation. Uh, the Japanese trial published by Dr. Hoda et al. Uh, in Journal of Thoracic Oncology, uh, also around 2018, also was pretty negative, but it was kind of the selection was all comers. It was expression, amplification, mutation, 
the mutants responded, but but the response rating total was pretty low because it was a mixed bag of, and it was small numbers to begin with, so hard to to draw conclusions. And then our investigator sponsor trial at Memorial Sloan Kettering, it's a cohort in the basket trial of TDM1, which uh, I had uh, led. Uh, and, and in fact, that was a, a project that was served the basis of my um, uh, fellowship training going from Australia to uh, New York uh, uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And that was translating the breast cancer discovery into lung cancer. And that was also the basis for my fellowship, a basis for the uh, ASCO Young Investigator Award at the time. And, and that cohort in her two mutants actually was read positive. So we had a 44% response rate. We had a median progression free survival of five months. And this was in heavily pretreated patient populations, often third, fourth, fifth line of therapy with prior chemo, prior um, her two targeted therapy and, and prior IO. So these patients really had nothing left to give except maybe some, some uh, chemotherapy like venerelbin or something. So that's thought to be a, an encouraging signal, but small numbers. And that's what's led the subsequent investigations and investment into this HER2 mutant uh, patient population, a rather obscure field of thoracic oncology at the time. But now it's, it's certainly created a new paradigm. So let's talk a little bit about TDXD. First, can you talk about kind of the way you, you know, maybe explain to your fellows sort of what it is, how it's built, you know, the the double uh, payload delivery, uh, and why it's different than other ADCs we've seen. Yeah. So this this is a uh, a new antibody uh, drug conjugate compared to TDM one. Uh, it's the same trastuzumab uh, backbone, uh, but uh, it has a different warhead and it's DXD in terms of DM1. And DXD is a irinotecan like, it's a, a substance, but it's much more potent. It's a topoisomerase 1 uh, inhibitor uh, and it's certainly much more potent than uh, DM1. Uh, and also we can pack a lot more warheads into the same missile. So the so-called drug to antibody ratio is twice compared to TDM1. Uh, you can just pack a lot of bombs in the in the smart bomb. So uh, per molecule, and then the linker uh, linking the warhead to the missile is also a slightly different uh, linker in terms of engineering. So it is a cleavable linker uh, rather than non-cleavable. Cleavable meaning that it can easily break off and then release the bomb uh, with ease within the cell. And that also has membrane permeability. Uh, so the, the drugs can, can, the toxins can penetrate from one cell to the neighboring cell to the neighboring cell rather than being confined within the cell membrane. So it can penetrate the membrane and kill neighboring cells. So we call that so-called bystander effect. And that may be responsible for some of the pneumonitis and interstitial lung disease that we, we can see with the, um, with trastuzumab deroxtecan. But it certainly, uh, get, has given it more advantage in terms of killing, uh, uh her2 mutant tumors. Uh, even with some tumor heterogeneity, it can still go around and kill neighboring, uh, cancer cells. So with all those differences in bioengineering, it is certainly a more potent ADC against this target. And we have seen activity in the TDM1 resistant uh, breast, HER2 positive breast cancers initially. And, we, and, and now certainly the Destiny Breast 03 and, uh, and, and other trials have shown that it's superior to TDM1 even in the, uh, in the second line setting. So similarly in lung cancer, we did the initial phase one trial in HER2 mutant knowing that borrowing from the TDM1 story, which I had um, the opportunity of leading uh, together in collaboration with Greg Riley and many others at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, just borrowing that concept and then de to develop TDXD or, or, or in HER2 or trastuzumab deroxtecan, we were able to hone in on the HER2 mutants. And in the phase one trial that we published in Cancer Discovery, this is Suratani et al. Uh, uh, in 2020, Cancer Discovery. And we showed that 
all comers, it was only a 28% response rate. But in the HER2 mutant lung cancer cohort, we had a more than 70% response rate. Uh, small numbers, but very encouraging signal uh, when you hone in on HER2 mutants with this more potent ADC. And that led to the Destiny Lung 01 trial, which we uh, did as a phase two. And this was uh, launched in 2018, but um, uh, we've, we've published that last, early of last year, just about a year ago, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and as Dr. LaRusso had pointed out in the ASCO uh, plenary discussion, uh, that case with the, in the waterfall, the one with the complete response on the right-hand side, actually was HER2 zero in terms of uh, uh, protein expression. So it actually has nothing to do with the protein uh, back to the photocopier, you know, making lots of copies of HER2. It's got nothing to do with that. It's the function of HER2 mutation that sucks the, the drug into the cell so, uh, that made a difference. So they had to be activated and mutated. And that trial, and then, of course, a little bit of dose uh, f uh, tweaking. The 6.4 milligram per kilogram was thought to be too high. We did Destiny Lung 02, which compared that with the lower dose and found that that lower dose was just as effective but less toxic. And that was subsequently served as the basis for FDA approval just a few months ago in August of 2022. And so that's the story uh, going back about a decade or so uh, behind the uh, the use of uh, antibody drug conjugates targeting uh, HER2 mutant lung cancer. It's the first ADC to be approved in lung cancer, but we are hoping that this creates a new paradigm of new a new class of drug that could be helpful for patients with lung cancer. I thought I understood ADCs until TDXD came along. So first of all, you mentioned Destiny 03 breast, where yeah. it you know, way better outcome than TDM1. So one ADC versus another, huge yeah. difference. And then the HER2 low, you know, Dr. Modi presented at ASCO. Again, you know, you think of targeted therapy. Now all of a sudden, well, wait a minute. We're not sure what the target is. I think I've seen some data even with responses in HER2 zero. You have the trope ADCs that, even though not everybody has trope, everybody seems to respond. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of confusion, at least on my mind, a little bit about, you know, sort of what these yeah. agents are and sort of where they're heading. Yeah, I think it's confusing for investigators and scientists uh, as well. So we're all learning uh, in uncharted waters. Uh, the, there are two drug development pathways for ADCs. One is the precision pathway, which is personally uh, my preferred way of developing drugs. You, you really want to bring the best drug to the, to the right patient uh, for maximal outcomes. And, but then the, that's usually a small slice of the pie, a small percentage of patients. Uh, and, uh, and that approach has its pros and cons. The HER2 mutant story is the prototype for that. And I hope to develop more for HER2 amplification and many other targets down the track. But there's another drug development pathway for ADCs, and that's using it as a just a chemotherapy. So it's given to everybody, like uh, NAB paclitaxel, right? So you give it to everybody. And you know, you're know you not going to aim for a precision medicine type of response rate or, or duration of response, but you're going to aim for like a docetaxel-like uh, uh, response, maybe slightly better, and then they can get a drug approval in the later line setting. And that's a strategy that's currently been developed for Trope 2 and there's CEA, CAM, and many other um ADCs uh, that are being uh, that are emerging in the lung cancer and other solid tumor space, and they don't necessarily need a companion diagnostic or a biomarker to select patients, because they're just going to give you like a twenty percent response rate, and then you know in the refractory setting, arguably it's better than nothing, and even though the duration of response may not be super high, but overall it's something, and there may still be a drug development. Uh, an approval strategy in that population. Personally, it's rather unsatisfactory to do it like that because it feels like you're going backwards. You've got all these engineering and then you're going back to the old days of chemo, a more expensive version of chemo. Uh, there's certainly, I can understand the, the, the company push to do so, but um, 
as an oncologist, I'd like to really see a lot more precision, especially in this day and age of technological transformation, to do some work honing in on the biomarkers of response, really find out it's got to be more than just IHC and, and mutation. It's, it is a lot more ADC biomarkers that need to be uncovered to really select the right patients who may respond to the right ADC. So I think the jury's still out in terms of where the future of ADCs will be. Uh, but certainly, I'm hoping for a more precision drug development pathway. Yeah, and I think that idea also ties into, I was kind of confused when I started to see the data looking at dose that you just referred to in lung cancer, uh, the study where you increase the dose, you just saw more toxicity and not greater efficacy. We had a couple yeah. of cases presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting by a doc actually from New York in the community where he gave TDXD to her too low patients who were like 90 and 91 years old, and he decided to start at a low dose and escalate them up, although I don't even know if that's been done. But you kind of were starting, to, again, it sounds like you said, a little bit like chemo and how it's yeah. been approached. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, it's it's a good question. In fact, I've we've looked at the data um, closely in the phase one dose escalation study. So in that study, you know, we had we started with low dose and we then dose escalated in 4.4, 5.4, 6.4, and even 7.4. So we uh, milligram per kilogram, and we we saw that the highest dose was too much. It was a lot of toxicity. We had patients who just you know get one dose. They the big big strong muscular men who who get one dose and they're laying in bed for the whole week and and they're having constant diarrhea and so forth. It's just not compatible. So we pushed it back and they dose de-escalated. And then in the phase one trial, we came back with the two recommended phase two trials, which led to the confusion. There was a 5.4 and a 6.4. And there were arguments on both sides. And so both were RP2D. In breast cancer, they're a lot more exquisite in terms of chemosensitivity. So um, a 5.4 dose was pursued because they thought that uh, some investigators and, and the uh, drug developers had thought that you know you don't need too much dosing for breasts, so you'd get away with 5.4, and that was right. I had always argued for 5.4, but there's also another in lung. But there's a school of thought that lung cancers are more chemo refractory; they they're not chemo sensitive, and therefore you need a stronger dose. And there's a no pain, no gain kind of concept. So 6.4 was was pursued, but evidently the Destiny Lung O2 had proven that that 5.4 is just as good and less toxic. So I think you do get into like a, like a plateau effect. It's there is a dose response relationship, just like chemotherapy, but because it's through a targeted delivery mechanism, it's not always the the, the more the merrier. So you get into a 5.4, even 4.4. A lot of my patients on in the uh, in the early days of drug development had been dose reduced to 4.4 and they're still responding today so for many years uh, so I, I think a lot of it may be eliciting an immune response long term and the dose really doesn't matter when when you get to that point point uh, on so it's not yeah it, it is treated like a chemo but it, it shouldn't it's not exactly the same well, the other thing, and when I first started hearing this from the breast people, I'm not so sure in terms of lung and GI, but I started to hear about like alopecia, GI effects. I think the uh, PI actually says you should give preemptive uh, GI meds for, for that. What have you observed in lung cancer in terms of those issues? Yeah, it's, it is certainly, uh, it's variable per patient. I've had patients who had no problems and others who just like, they're really miserable. And, and it mirrors some chemotherapies and some can produce really horrible side effects and others sort of get, get along, go, go about with life. So I tend to use um, palinozotron uh, in the uh, and dexamethasone as a chemotherapy pre-medication, just like if I'm to give carboplatin. So they're moderately immunogenic and in some, I don't routinely give fosoprepotent, but you can. Uh, and when you do that, you're going to constipate some patients, so that could offset some of the diarrhea effects. So I don't tend to give loperamide like you do for neratinib and, and some TKI, fatinib and other TKIs. I don't tend to do that. I find that most patients wouldn't need it. 
if they get enough anti-emetics. But certainly diarrhea is, is, is possible and we have to account for that and manage it with supportive medicines at the earliest uh, instance. So uh, you talked about the first-line trial that you're doing, and earlier you were talking about the IPASS study, which, again, for people new to oncology, that was really the first study that compared yeah. targeted therapy to chemo. Then they did some stuff like that in ALK, and they stopped doing that, and if people had response rates of 50%, 60%. People just started using a first-line, like in RET, et cetera. Yeah. But again, this is a little bit different. So globally, when you look at TDXD and HER2 mutant, lung cancer. First of all, what are you seeing in terms of response rate and also duration of response? And how does that compare to what you see with osimertinib or, you know, the ALK inhibitors? Yeah, certainly. The uh, the mechanism of action is, is quite different compared to uh, uh, the EGFR uh, TKIs. So uh, there are some corollary, some some areas of similarity, but but overall, I don't think they can be judged the same way. And, and is, it is kind of like a smart targeted chemotherapy. So I'd see it like a precision chemotherapy, so to speak. And the response rates have been about 50 to 60%. And interestingly, I'm seeing some immune effects. Some of my patients, you know, even treated off protocol, they, they've some of them respond very quickly uh, in the first scan and get a partial response. But some of my patients actually get stable disease for a year and a half, and then they start to get the partial response. And then I had to, just had a patient two years out, and he's got a complete response. So it's, wow. it's, uh, those, are, those are not the same as classic targeted therapy mechanisms. You know, you take the TKI and then you have this resurrection effect um, uh, from, from the ICU that, that you tend to see with this lock and key approach of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This is more chemotherapy. It's a slow, gradual response, but then there's this immune component that can come later and then you, you get this meltdown of, of tumors. So uh, I think they're, they're different. So I don't just look at the um, uh, the response rate, uh, you have to look at the full picture. And the full picture is certainly looking promising. In a refractory setting, you're seeing a median uh, PFS or progression-free survival of about eight months. You get a median duration response of nine months. Uh, but this is in heavily pretreated refractory setting. If you bring it to first line, just like what we saw with Destiny Breast 03, you may get much better outcomes in terms of uh, 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 progression-free survival. And interestingly, in the BREAST-03 study, we also saw less toxicity if you give it up front rather than give it really later on. You know, there, was, there were no treatment-related deaths. The toxicities were, were much better managed. So if you give it early line, of course, you learn how to manage the toxicities over time. So, so that's also uh, made a difference. Uh, but um, we are hoping in Destiny Lung-01, we're going to see some similar improvements in outcomes if you give it first line rather than in a chemo refractory setting. And if it's a smart chemotherapy, you know, you really want to give it uh, earlier on rather than when the drug is getting resistant. So that's the, there's some uh, hope that this would be superior to even chemotherapy and pembrolizumab in the first line setting if we, uh, if we choose it, choose the right patient population. So, but the jury's still out. We'll, we'll still have to complete the study. And uh, in that study, uh, first of all, uh, do you allow Pembro alone for high PD-1 or they have to get Pembro chemo? Uh, it's Pembro chemo just to keep it homogeneous so you don't have too many biases. And, and also there's a school of thought, you know, in HER2 mutant, they're all HER2 mutant. So regardless of pd one expression, maybe the response is going to be slightly lower with single agent IO and therefore we give um, chemo IO. That's the thought process at, at trial design. There's a lot of debate about this. And, and I could easily see this going into a, a, a Neil Love uh, point counterpoint uh, sessions when you have uh, uh, investigators debating. I, there's, no, there's no hard answer to this yet. And in the uh, TDXD arm, it's just TDXD, not with an IO. There's yeah. not a third arm. So just straightforward because, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you debated yeah. that we too. 
Yeah, we, we'd also discussed about the, the I.O. combo, but uh, there's a school of thought to keep the trial simple, not to uh, ask too many questions in one trial. Just keep it simple, get a straight answer. Otherwise, you get too many confounders uh, and so forth. And it's also a, a difficult trial to accrue because it's it's 2%. Not everyone gets HER2 testing routinely. And uh, and therefore, it's it'll, you know, if you get too many arms, it's going to be twice as long uh, to complete Absolutely. Yeah, that'll be uh, really interesting. Uh, when do you think we're going to get a readout on that? So I'm hoping to uh, – so I presented the, uh, the trial design last year in ASCO. Uh, that's just without just, – just that the reporting that we started the trial. We started enrolling and, and it's going well uh, and the design. But um, I'm hoping maybe by preliminary, maybe next year, I don't – I don't know for sure, but um, it, it really depends. It's been it's also difficult to accrue in the first line setting because patients are when they're diagnosed, they're understandably anxious. They want to get onto a treatment quickly. And the trial, you know, you always have to test for the mutation. And not everyone gets upfront HER2 testing. And it takes a long time to get NGS back. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we've rolled out a reflex PCR testing for all patients with non-small cell lung cancer just to catch those 2% of patients who may benefit. And that takes a few days. But if you do NGS or liquid biopsies or at MSK with you use MSK impact, that all takes a couple of weeks. And, and then you've got to identify that. Then you start the consent process and you've got trial eligibility screening and then enrollment and then treatment. So that is all time. So it's, it's sometimes hard for patients to, to wait that long and, uh, and to get onto the trial. So it's, it's somewhat difficult from that. There are some logistical hurdles. But as we were talking earlier with the uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, uh, New Economy International Cancer Coalition, you're really trying to work together across stakeholders to simplify clinical trials, make it a less cumbersome process for patients to get on, to provide access more to community, uh, uh, patients in the community and community oncologists through maybe a decentralized trial um, uh, model uh, or a hub and spoke model that we, we published in Nature Medicine, we described it. Through that collaborative model, we may be able to bring innovation to patients, not only in academic centers, but across across the board in community. And that serves that disparity concept that you, you have um, talked about earlier on. Uh, it's really disparity and equity uh, from my standpoint is not only for uh, social justice, but it's also, which is important on its own. But in, in my world of curing cancer, it's absolutely critical to to engage all patients, then you can accelerate the, the accrual. You know, my TDXD first line trial, if done in a, in a really uh, diversified, collaborative manner uh, and bringing it to the patient, we can accrue like wildfire. We, you asked me, when's the readout? You know, with that approach, maybe this ASCO, you know, if we can do it properly uh, uh, with true international collaboration. We're going to accelerate the timeline of drug discovery and, and approvals, and and then you you fast track that to all trials. Uh, you're going to see the cure for cancer, you know. So it'll keep you very busy with the podcasts, uh, but uh, it's it's really something that I can see happening if we if we get it right through collaboration. Because my patients, many of my patients with metastatic lung cancer, you know, thought to be a death sentence, you know, just not that many years ago. They're living five, ten years out. You know, I'm seeing these patients who have complete response. Many are in NED. You, know, you do a scan, there's no evidence of disease. They have brain and spine metastasis to begin with. But I just monitor some patients, you know, with a scan every three to six months. And, and they're not cured because they can come back because of metastatic disease from the outset. But, you know, they, they get on with their lives. So that's sort of it's not a complete cure, but I think we're getting closer and closer to the cure for cancer. And, but we have to do the clinical trials right. And, and that's the, the issue that we're, we're currently encountering. You know, what if everyone in the world with HER2 mutations will, will get a notification on their app uh, and, and it's optional, we've got to protect their privacy and confidentiality and everything, but there are ways to do that. You get an app and you tell them where are the HER2 trials, first line, second line, and then we work with the local on oncologist to bring that medicine 
to the patient. So in we published a study a few years ago in JAMA Oncology for, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. You know, we already show that um, more than three, about three quarters of, of patients, and some studies quoting higher figure, are, are treated in the community. Patients want to get their care close to home. They don't want to travel thousands of miles and jump through hoops and you know, hire, stay in a hotel and waiting the waiting room of academic centers. They want to continue their life. So they want to be treated locally. But the trials are not often not available to because it's so complicated. And community docs are busy. You know, they're busy enough treating patients. So then you, you get suboptimal care because we know that clinical trials are widely recognized as the best care of patients with cancer. But we're not making them easily accessible and available to patients. So by doing that, leveraging the community docs, which your enterprise has vast networks of access to community docs. You know, if we can rev them up and then we change the equation and change the rules of clinical trials, make them to be the key players, the leaders on clinical trials with support. And there's a lot of industry funding in oncology research and we can easily hire an NP or a, or a PA, you know, to support clinical trials in community practices. Um, uh, to support the community docs, then together, you know, through a collaborative model, you know, we can really accelerate these trials uh, to completion and therefore the cure for cancer. You know, I was telling you about this disparity uh, presentation we did. One of the things that we did, because every now and then we also do programs where we interview patients, and I showed a short clip from an interview I did of a patient with myeloma, who'd been on the um, the uh, bispecific uh, antibody teclistamab for a year and a half, doing great, responding, no symptoms. And the day that I interviewed him was the day it got approved. And he'd been on it for wow. a year and a half. Not only that, it was approved as fifth-line therapy. He got it as like second-line therapy. So it was like just a classic example of the advantage of being in clinical trials. Anyhow, getting back to TDXD, I think you referred to the fact that the one thing I was going to curious about, and one of the reasons I asked you, I know it's different than ALK and EGFR, but also from the point of view of docs and practice, it's different. To me, it looks like the responses aren't as long. You said nine months, I know, you know, eight or nine months, yeah. which it yeah. sounds shorter than like what you see with EGFR and ALK. Is that the case? Yes, it, it depends on the uh, chemo sensitivity of the disease. So in breast cancer, you're seeing uh, a bit longer than that. And also it's longer if you give it upfront in, in the first or second line setting rather than fourth and fifth line. So I think those numbers can change depending on the clinical context. And we're hoping that Destiny Lung 04, which is the, the first line trial, will produce superior outcomes. But the jury's still out and uh, and it's, it's really a... a a, a chemotherapy delivery system, so it's it's a bit different to the tyrosine kinase. So we can't, I can't really uh, equate one with the other. You can probably, you know, borrow, you know, EGFR, ALK, ROS1, RET. These are very similar uh, in terms of their their action, uh, but of uh, mechanism of action. But ADCs are, are, are very different, and and I, I therefore randomized control trials still play an important role. All right, so let's tackle the elephant in the room, ILD. And, of course, we talk about this all the time with the breasts and the GI people. And, you know, our discussions with the lung people are a little different. I don't know whether it's because there's so much, you know, pulmonary issues already with the typical lung cancer patients because they smoked and COPD or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know. I kind of get the feeling that the lung people aren't as concerned about it. But anyhow, I know you've been very involved you know, we did a whole program where we work with a pulmonologist trying to dissect out the whole issue of ILD. So can you talk about what's been seen in the lung cancer trials in terms of ILD uh, in comparison to what's been seen with breast and GI? And for practical purposes right now, and incidentally, you, you got your first line trial, but you know, we have our way of doing stuff is we just go out to 25 investigators and say, well, let's put the reimbursement aside. What would you like to do? And I'll tell you that half of your colleagues right now would like to give TDXD first line. Yeah, yeah. It shows the historical perspective of thoracic oncology. You know, we favor targeted therapy over chemo. So that's, that's the right. uh, almost a, a dogmatic uh, approach to things. You've got to target a therapy, you've got to target, and that's the way to go. So 
I, I think there, and personally, I feel the same way, but I just need to put it to, uh, to a trial to prove it so that we, we can do it right because you can get it wrong. And it's a different, it's a different uh, act, mechanism of action to the pill, uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. In terms of ILD, it's not benign. It's, it could be uh, certainly fatal. Our Destiny Lung 01 trials uh, had, had reported the, uh, the fatality. So did most um, TDXD trials, except Destiny Breast 03, which gave it early line with extensive education and early intervention program that actually made the difference. So we we are hoping to uh, to improve upon that uh, that statistic. You know, in the breast Destiny Lung 01 trial, we uh, we're seeing uh, about a 13 percent rate of pneumonitis uh, and ILD. So. You, know, you largely can say 10 to 15 percent is sort of the ballpark, but we're hoping to to reduce that that number. Uh, most of them are benign, are, are pretty mild, grade one and grade two, about half of them, but some are serious. So you you got to uh, uh, we'd say that 75 um, percent we can say are manageable. They're usually treatable, lower grade, but there is this 25 percent of ILD that is potentially serious and, and you might need hospitalization and you might need uh, intravenous steroids. And, and if you intervene early, it's good, but if late, it could be fatal. Uh, thoracic oncologists are kind of used to doing this with IO-related, immune-related pneumonitis. You know, it was once upon a time very scary as well. And, and we had lots of education workshops and CME, how to manage immune checkpoint, lots of guidelines being published. Uh, and I had participated in some of them in the early days. But and, and I can still remember back then there was a lot of fear. But now it's it's bread and butter for us as thoracic oncologists. And we're used to people who are coming with oxygen tanks uh, with COPD and all that. And you know that these patients are higher risk, but we still give immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we're kind of accustomed to that sort of high risk population and, and managing it. In a way, it's not that much different in terms of TDXD, ILD management. It's early recognition and early intervention with steroids uh, and oxygen. So, so if we get that, if we learned how to do that with immune checkpoint pneumonitis, then the thoracic oncology docs are a little bit more comfortable uh, dealing with it in the uh, ADC context. So I think I figured out the algorithm to uh, detect ILD in the breast cancer people. I think, first of all, uh, their approach is if you pick it up when it's asymptomatic, then theoretically you can re-challenge. If you pick them up when they have symptoms, they're done. Does that algorithm apply to lung cancer? Yeah, generally that's that's the same algorithm that we're using across the uh, Destiny trials, and uh, we we recently published uh, an algorithm in Cancer Treatment Reviews with Sandra Swain as first author, right? And we yeah, so that sort of serve as as some some guide, just like the early days of IO pneumonitis, which is actually quite quite similar in I. In IO pneumonitis, you re-challenge when they're asymptomatic, uh, if you have uh, patches or you have very mild symptoms. But if you're hospitalized, if, you, if it's got severe um, uh, complications, then you really think twice about re-challenging. So it's not necessarily that easy to read those kind of papers and figure out like what you're supposed to do. So the other issue is imaging. So, uh, again, the breast people right now are saying we're trying to get imaging every eight or nine weeks, maybe for a long time, even if they don't need the imaging because of their metastatic disease, because we want to pick this up asymptomatic. Again, is that kind of the way you see it going in lung? Yeah, on the on the trial, we're we're seeing it every uh, every six weeks uh, with imaging. That's mandated by the trial for that very reason of picking it up. But in standard practice, I tend to do it uh, every uh, initially, perhaps every two to three cycles. But over time, uh, every three to four is is perfectly appropriate. And and if the patient is asymptomatic, they got their pulse oximeter at home, and I'm checking everything. I don't think that 
you know, too frequent scanning is is a bit of a burden for patients, and uh, and I don't I don't think there's great evidence saying that if you just hold the drug at the uh, earliest onset of a little patch uh, that are non-specific, it could be that you just had you know you had a flu or you had COVID, and and you don't know you can really you can't work it out on the CT scan. Then what do you do? Um, so it's uh, there's a lot of unknowns in that context. I think. On clinical trials, you've got to be very vigilant, but in, in standard practice, uh, I, I think it's, it has to be a bit more personalized. I wouldn't be as dogmatic. Yes, you do need uh, CT monitoring uh, every, every few cycles, whether it's every two or every four. I think it depends on the patient. So I know if we present a patient uh, in the, at one of our breast cancer programs who already has some kind of lung problem, they get very, very nervous about using TDXD because they don't see it that much. Most breast cancer patients don't have pre-existing lung problems. Like, yeah, most of your patients do. So again, right. uh, I, how does the trial handle, handle prior C, COPD and other pul- cardiopulmonary problems? And clinically, uh, what do you do when you want to use, you have a HER2 mutant situation, but yet the patient's got maybe even symptomatic COPD? Yeah. So those those cases, um, it's a risk benefit ratio discussion with the patient. Uh, the same could apply with IO checkpoint, uh, which can cause pneumonitis uh, in a fair number of patients. And if they have COPD and they're on oxygen and they have like a one lung, um, do you give it or do you just let them go? I mean, that's that is a question that we have to individually discuss with the patient. But in my experience, it's not an absolute contraindication. And there are instances where the cancer is going to imminently kill you in the next few weeks unless you do something about it and you've got this drug, you've got a shot, it's a double-edged sword. Do you, do you give it a shot or do you just let yourself go? I mean, that the patient needs to, to uh, make that decision together with the oncologist. Uh, but I don't, I don't see this as an absolute uh, contraindication, particularly coming from a lung cancer perspective, where where they all have some lung condition. So I wouldn't. I think that speaks to the to the uncertainty and the experience from the bit different subspecialties, and it's a again a reflection of different silos and different uh, ways of thinking. In breast, their lungs are healthy. Uh, breast breast cancer community and and the earliest incidence of any lung condition, they get frightened about it, and it's the uncertainties. Uh, can produce a lot of fear, not only in patients, but among oncologists as well. But the thoracic oncologists are much more used to doing this. So there's a lot more comfort level. And I think you can learn from one specialty to another. And that, you know, to give a plug to community oncologists who see different, uh, a variety of different uh, clinical contexts and tumor types, they can get a better appreciation of what's clinically important. And some of them are clinically significant, but many of those concerns are not. So uh, I, I think we need to take a step back and and hear what, uh, like what you're doing, hearing from different points of view, and then take a, a balanced view on this. But my my uh, approach to TDXD pneumonitis is very similar to my approach to IO checkpoints. You bring up the general medical oncologist who is hearing from the GI people, they're hearing from the lung people, hearing from the breast one of the things they hear from the GI people that they don't hear from you and they don't hear from the breast is the GI, you can ask Dr. Janjijan, they're all into repeating HER2. So if yeah. they're HER2 positive and then they, they'll do another assay when they progress or something, and if they're HER2 zero, then they don't use the HER2. Whereas breasts, once you're HER2, they'll just keep using it. Again, any thoughts about retesting in lung cancer? Yeah. So if it's HER2 mutant, it's like EGFR mutation. They tend to stay, so they don't they don't go away. It's an oncogenic driver. It's constitutively active, uh, and and I wouldn't need to retest it for the sake of checking if it's still there. But I would do the repeat biopsy and NGS just to look for resistance mechanisms uh, that may emerge and that may be targeted with new therapeutics. So I do a lot of rebiopsy. From, from more for a clinical research and clinical trial matching point of view, but not so much for the HER2 mutation testing. And, and with amplification, uh, 
uh, things can be a lot more heterogeneous. And, and it sounds like the uh, loss of HER2 is a big thing in, in, in gastric, but not so much in breast. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, though, about the mutations. That's really interesting. Let me ask you, do you envision in the future that maybe there's going to be a pan-tumor approval of, say, TDXD for just HER2 mutant disease in general, regardless of the primary? That's a great question. And in fact, this is the the concept for the Pantumor 01 clinical, the Destiny Pantumor 01, which, which um, I had presented the design a couple of years ago to ASCO. And it's, uh, we just completed a crawl. And uh, the jury's still out. We have to do some data analysis properly. And this is specifically looking at um, uh, the HER2 mutant solid, uh, uh, different types of solid tumors. This is a pretty simple design. You know, if it's a, it's the same drug, you give it in a oncogene selected patient population across multiple tumor types that are not lung cancer because we've already got an approval for lung. So we're looking at uh, biliary tract cancers and colorectal cancers and breast cancers that are HER2 mutant but not amplified or expressed and um, and ovarian cancers, and then we tr we're looking at responses in those. And this is a trial with a pan-tumor uh, approval in mind. And whether that's going to pan out or not, I will we'll have to give it a little bit of time, but I'm, I'm hoping to see the, read out the results much sooner uh, because we, we had completed accrual. So this is a um, very important study that could open up a new indication for patients with different, not just lung cancer, but many different types. Yeah, the oncologists are all over that. We actually had a general medical oncologist who presented, and we, had, we were doing a GYN uh, program, uh, two cases of cancer of the endometrium. Now, I didn't ask whether it's HER2 mutant or HER2 overexpressed, but the doc gave the, both patients TDXD. One had a CR, the other one had a good PR. So I got a feeling people are going to start doing that before your trials reported, but it'd be great to get the data. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very encouraging to hear. And, and certainly I'm going to feed that back to my uh, co-investigators on, on this study to really uh, try to push this paradigm forward. It's, it's a little bit difficult to tease out because now you have her too low breast cancer approval. So it, is it driven by the mutation or is it driven by the low protein? And, and sometimes a lot of biomarker analysis needs to be done. But that this is, this is an important uh, uh, new concept and it could deliver a breakthrough drug for many, many patients in need. And I, you just cited some examples of clearly some, some lives being saved. The Destiny uh, Lung 04 is still uh, a little bit of time away, and this is an international trial that we're, we're doing across North America, in Latin America, Asia, and, and, um, and Europe. So that's, that's what's what it takes to, to accrue to a study of this size. And, and this is in a, a rare tumor uh, population, arguably not commonly tested. Most uh, uh, oncology practices do not test for HER2 unless it's a part of a broad NGS panel, which takes time to get results. One of the things I like about this is that you could really get equipoise about either arm. I don't see a problem randomizing somebody on a trial like this. I think it's really hard to predict which one's going to be better for me. I think most people would be fine with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they, they still, if you get chemo, we can still give them TDXD later on. So you can get the best of both worlds. And, and most patients are actually uh, very happy to go to do this. And if this could be, I mean, the trials already started, but I'm, I'm just using it as an example uh, of such trials. And many of such trials are going to happen in the future. If we can broaden access to community oncologists and, and make trials a, a really a reality, not just in the academic centers where you're only seeing a quarter of patients, but broaden it to the three quarters of patients who are seeing in the community. That's going to lead to a sea change in terms of the, uh, the, the pace of, of breakthroughs and also the, the ability to collaborate internationally. Because if, if I can collaborate with someone in Nebraska in a community oncology um, and we can, you know, through, through telemedicine and through Zoom and you can connect to all corners of the world, you know, if there's Wi-Fi and we could 
definitely um, do a lot of the monitoring also remotely. You still have to have a very good local oncologist, and that's that's uh, essential. Tech, no technology is going to be able to replace that, but you empower that oncologist with technology, with resources. Uh, you know, we can we can really do a lot. So I'm uh, hoping that the uh, the Neil Love uh, network of oncologists uh, could also be empowered uh, to to do their part and, and lead uh, trials in that regard. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. Lee, and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for Oncology Today. <laughs>